I started to understand what really wasn't about gifts. It was about relationships. It was about referrals. It was about people trusting you. Hi, everyone. It's Kara Golden from The Kara Golden Show, and I'm here with John Rulin. He is the co-founder and CEO, author of one of my new favorite books, Giftology, that I've got here, which is so, so good and has this amazing bookmark in it as well that is a lot of fun. Uh, if In case you haven't heard of John, uh, he is... I've heard him speak in multiple situations now. We were actually connected through our mutual friend, actually two friends, Scott McGregor and uh, Michael Burnoff. And he, his company, Giftology, helps companies find success through the art of gifting. And it sounds like a simple mission, but uh, one that I think we all have to be reminded about and sort of what gets people to ultimately pay attention. And I think it goes back to kindness and gratitude and lots of things that I talk about and firmly believe as well. But before founding his company, John was selling knives, knives, that's right. And in fact, he sent me an incredible set of knives, which was out of control. It was um, it, pretty awesome. So uh, he worked with one of the top knife manufacturers in the U.S., Cutco, and he became the number one uh became the number one performer out of 1.5 million sales reps. I mean, amazing. And I want to understand what the secret was there for sure. We'll get into that. Uh, but since then, he's he's just made all kinds of investments in gifting and started a company around it. And he's also an angel investor too. Um, he's one of the world's leading authority in maximizing customer loyalty. We'll get into that. And I'm so excited to have John on the show. So welcome. Thank you for having me, Kara. This is, uh, this is going to be a fun conversation. I, uh, I love talking to people that, uh, that live what we teach, which is, you know, which is you. So this should, this should be fun. The focus of my show is talking to founders and CEOs. I, I uh, not only like to talk about the company, but I really like to talk about the journey because I, I think there's a, there's a lot of people who are trying to figure things out in their life and what do they do and what are their skills and should I go into a different industry? What should I major in in college? And so I always ask this question at the beginning. Let's go back to the beginning. Who was John as a kid? Sometimes when they hear, you know, uh, number one out of 1.5 million or the Cubs as clients were speaking on Google stage. People will assume that I grew up in like LA or New York or some cool city. I grew up milking goats on a 47 acre farm, one of six kids in the middle of Nowheresville, Ohio. So I grew up literally the town's 315 people, um, Delroy. So I grew up um, learning what I didn't want to do for most of my life, which was milk goats. We had a one acre garden, all that kind of stuff. Um, and I hated manual labor. I hated smelling like goats when I went to school in the morning. Yeah, you know, I was up at five, six a.m. Um, but I learned work ethic, and I learned you know persistence, grit, all those sorts of things. Um, and so I wanted to get out of Dodge. I wanted to get out of the, the small community I was in. And I was going to go make my mom proud because she was into health and wellness, which is really rare in you know country bumpkinville, Ohio. Ohio, we, yeah, yeah. But she she was like shipping in vitamins and. You know, like our, our pancakes weren't this quick. They were like, um, you know, buckwheat from like the Amish. Like she was like super health oriented, which when you're poor is unusual. So I was going to go make my mom proud and become a DO or a chiropractor, uh, more alternative, but still like, and, um, you know, my life kind of changed in undergrad. I'm 20 years old trying to pay for, you know, undergrad to go to med school. And, uh, out of desperation, I went to sell the knives and the only reason I did it was because I was like, I, my college was like $20,000. And you, if you work at Gap for, at the time, it was $5 an hour, you're not going to be able to pay for med school. Um, mm -hmm. So I go into the interview. I literally wore my glasses to look smarter. And I wore the one tie I had on in the interview. And I'm sweating bullets. So I get hired. And I'm like, if I last four weeks, it'll be a miracle. Because I didn't have a sales background. I didn't have a sales experience. And, um, and my life. Really and you did changed. this I'm when not, you were in college, like you, you were, yeah, you're 20 yeah, years I'm, old. You're, yeah, I'm 20 wild. years old. I'm desperate. I'm out of desperation. 
And the only reason I went into the interview is my buddy who was a seminary student was selling the knives and he was the worst salesperson in the world. Like he couldn't sell water to somebody in the middle of the desert. Like he was just the antithesis of a salesperson. And he's selling these like, you know, $500 to, you know, full set of cut coats, 12 grand, like expensive. And I'm like, who's buying these? Like 12 grand might as well have been $12 million. And so I was like, if Steve can do it, I can at least try. So I went in and get hired. My fourth appointment, I pitched my girlfriend's dad, who's this rainmaking attorney. And uh, if you've never pitched your girlfriend's dad knives, like that's the weirdest, awkward. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like imagine like, and, and the reason I pitched him was that Paul was also really, really generous. He was always giving things away. Like he'd find a deal on noodles. Everybody at church the next Sunday, with like 200 people would walk away. And I'm like, Paul, that was 40 grand. Like, why would you do that? And he would just smile and be like, that's just how I like to show up for people. So I pitch him the knives and I'm thinking maybe he'll buy the hundred and $200 pocket knives that, you know, like for the clients, there's a lot of the people in that area when hunting, fishing, they're a bunch of dudes. And, um, and Paul's like changed my life forever. He's like, I don't order pocket knives, got to order the pairing knives. And these are like hundred dollar pairing knives. I'm like, Paul, why would you give a bunch of grown men CEOs like a kitchen tool? That just seemed, you know, I'm like so green. I'm, I'm a country bumpkin. Like, and Paul, Paul's like, the reason I have more referrals, deal flow access is I found out a simple truth. I started my firm 30 years ago and I found out if you take care of the family in business, everything else takes care of itself. So that was the aha moment for me. It wasn't about the stupid knives. Paul understood relationships. He understood what I call the inner circle, taking care of somebody's assistant or their kids or their, 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 their wife or their husband. And so I started to mimic Paul. I was like, I want to be him when I'm 60. I'm 20. I got 40 years to get there. And so I started to figure some of these things out. And I started to understand what really wasn't about gifts. It was about relationships. It was about referrals. It was about people trusting you and liking you. So Cutco, that, that number 1.5 million is now 2 million. Um, so we became the number one rep worldwide for Cutco by the time I was a senior in college by figuring out that it wasn't about the knives by basically what we now call giftology, which is just really a recipe. It's a system for how to drive revenue, how to drive relationships using generosity and gratitude as the delivery vehicle. So um, that's... Yeah, that was the beginning point. That's 20 years ago. I'm 41. So I'm halfway to, to where Paul was at. And he had three daughters. I now have four girls. So I guess I'm trying to maybe exceed where uh, he was at. I'm trying to, you know, overcompensate. But uh, but that's where it all started. That's hysterical. So how long did you, were you at Cutco then? Well, what was interesting is, you know, Cutco has this internship program and I, I learned very quickly that these knives were a great gift. So I started the, the giftology. It was called ruling group for a long time. But I realized if you if I called somebody and said, hey, Mr. CEO of a $10 million company, I have this great idea. I want to sell you knives for your company. They would hang up. But but if I but if I had another person send them knives with their name engraved on it and their logo or whatever else, they'd be like, this is amazing. Where'd you get this? Well, they would then take the meeting and then I would show them like, hey, the reason I got the meeting was because I actually comped that gift for this person. I started to show people that I could help them 10x their referrals or 100x their loyalty or they all wanted certain things to happen in their business, retention, whatever else. And so I started the agency back then. And then I went to Cutco and partnered with them and said, hey, I want to be able to buy X number of product, whatever else. And so we, to this day, we've had a 20 year relationship as like kind of a handshake. They're a supplier of ours on the gifting side. And instead of, you know, Cutco is a $300 million company, privately owned, like world class, but they, for 70 years, they were selling to homeowners one set at a time. I would go to them and say, I want to buy a thousand sets. And oh, by the way, I'm going to take your product and put it into the hands of these pro sports teams or into Google executives. Like, so we became like their, almost like their poster child of like ambassador, partner, all of the, you know, we got them in the New York times, all of these different things. But it was really like understanding that I needed to start a separate company and partner with them. I couldn't be a Cutco person necessarily. I was going to be this, you know, agency owner. And, uh, and so that's been basically since the start. So to this day, we still buy millions of dollars in the crazy knives and um, and use that as one of our tools in our toolkit to 
um, you know, even to this day, like we had a client that wanted to give a gift to Tony Robbins. Like, what do you give Tony Robbins? Like he can buy a hundred or a thousand of anything. And so I said, Pete, we're going to send him knives. And he's like, come on, Tony Robbins. I said, well, we're going to take this big knife set. So it's $7,500 knife set. And on all 40 of the pieces, we're going to engrave from 40 years of him speaking all of his quotes. And then we're going to put it in that same box that you got. It's a $3,000 wood box with video screen. And then you're going to pour out your heart talking about like future Robin's grandkids will think about the legacy as they, you know, break bread and share, you know, food and drink, whatever else. And Pete's like, we're going to send a $10,000 gift to Tony. It's going to be nice. Let's say, yep. We sent it. Sage called four months later, Pete, and said, we get a lot of gifts. She was in tears. She's like, it wasn't about the knives. It was about what was engraved in your video just made us maybe break down. And, uh, he's, and, and like now that knife set, you know, Tony has what, 10 homes, but you know, our client owns one of the most valuable pieces of real estate, the, the countertop of Tony Robbins house. Every time they, anybody walks past the stupid knives are there reminding them of the relationship. And that's really what it comes down to is, is you can never buy something for an affluent person they couldn't buy for themselves, but you, you can give them something that honors them, their core values, their legacy. And now like there's a, you know, a story that's attached to something that they love to share when you're not around. And, and we all, but even billionaires love to have something that reminds them of something of, that's core to them. And so um, to this day, we still do a lot with the, with the crazy cut the knives. That's amazing. So the ruling group, so you founded an agency around this whole concept where you could continue to grow. And then does that still exist or did you just end up switching it to giftology or how does that all? Yeah. Yeah. Well, nobody knew what ruling group was when we wrote the book giftology, nobody cared. Like, right. That people are like really gifting. And, and then we started to show like, well, it wasn't, you know, the gift was just a delivery vehicle for an emotion. And here's the, you know, we started to realize that, you know, when we started talking about return on relationship, eating ROI for breakfast, and we got really clear on what we were talking about. So early on, it was ruling group. And then when we wrote the book, we were like, everybody's starting to know about this book because it was self-published, but it started to go international. You know, we sold 100,000 copies. All of a sudden, people were like taking notice. And so we changed the name from ruling group to giftology group because it really, it was more in alignment. But yeah, we still have the agency. I mean, the done for you, like companies that are you know, doing five, 10 million in revenue all the way up to the Chicago Cubs will hire us to do, you know, it's not hard to give one person a gift, but if you want to scale your thoughtfulness and you want to send something to your top 100 investors or your top 500 employees, most people are like, that's too hard. They start cutting corners. They don't, they don't do the handwritten note. They don't do the video. They don't do the engraving. And so our agency still exists, but that platform has allowed us to start getting advisory shares in other companies. It started to allow us to invest in other businesses. So um, I still have the consulting and the speaking, the gift agency, and then now we have a holding company. Um, but the you know the people that don't really know us that well are like, oh, you're still doing the little gifting thing. And I'm like, kind of. Yeah. 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 Hint is, hint, hint is still doing that little water thing too. So it's you like, understand. Right. yeah, no, I totally do. Like, why, why'd you start a water company? You know? Okay. All right. It's like it's it got a bigger purpose behind it. So I totally Amen. I totally get it. And as uh, you know, I was at in the early 90s when uh, Ted Turner was still gracing us running around uh, the CNN offices. This is like cable was in 40 percent of um, homes at that point. And, you know, he believed that there should be 24 hour news. I mean, people I tell people all the time, it's like you know, until people understand, then they will grab on to some small thought and, and say that you're in that gifting business, right? I mean, you're, and they just don't get it until they get it. They don't get it. So yeah, it's, they discount it. They discount yeah. it. It's like, because they don't understand. And that yeah, it's, I love being the underdog, right? And I think you do too. Like it's fun. Um, it gives me fuel. It's, um, but yeah, I mean the, the people that, even the knife thing, they're like, oh, you still are attached to the knife thing? I'm like, I don't think you understand, A, that it's a $300 million company that's actually like just a world, like literally like yeah. the founder, you know, whether you like the founder of Uber or not, Trevor um, it, it, or Travis, his first job was selling knives. We found yeah. you know, the guy who wrote Miracle Morning, how Elrod, 20-year friend, 
this first job selling knives. Like it's a personal development company that also happens to make world-class cutlery. And uh, it's, it's fun to see people like discount and undervalue something and then come back around five years later. And they're like, Oh, that that's what you do. That's pretty awesome. Um, so I, I love, I, yeah, I love when people discount me. I love it. So in your book, you talk about the difference between gifts and artifacts. And so how should people when they are gifting? I mean, what what do you think? Uh, everybody wants to find that special gift. Maybe they don't think knives are it, uh, you yeah. know, even though, uh, you know, you gave a great example of, of talking about making it more personalized in some way. Explain that a little bit more from the book. Yeah. Well, I think what most people, when they think of gifts, they think of, you know, what, like the Chevy Chase Jelly of the Month Club. They think of Harry David baskets, cases of wine, Amazon gift cards, or the polo shirt with a logo the size of a softball. Like, those are all like promotional products, swag. Like, that's not, a, like, that's not really a gift, in my opinion. And I don't even really like the word gift because of the sandbox it puts people in. We use the word artifact because artifact dignifies meaning and lasting and, and story and all of these things that are deep. And so I like to liken like an artifact, like if your house was on fire, you'd grab a handful of things that had the most meaning, not necessarily the most expensive. It might be pictures. It might be like a plaque. It might be a, a flag that if you're, you know, one of your family members or your grandfather served in the military. It's things that have meaning and story. Those are artifacts. And so I hate the word gift because it, it, everybody in, in business thinks they're in the relationship business, but most people give things out of transactional relationships. If you do a deal with somebody, here's your gift. You've, you've you know, been an employee for 10 years. That's 20,000 hours. Here's your token. Meanwhile, you'd never call any of those relationships a token relationship. It devalues the relationship. And so to me, like an artifact or a true gift, think about it like your best friend's wedding. You know, if you're going to do like a beautiful Tiffany's vase or something, you know, like I'm never going to engrave that with giftology. Like that would be the cheesiest thing in the world. You're never going to give your best friend a, you know, a Tiffany's vase with hints on it. Like that's a gift for you. A gift by its very nature is recipient focus. So the reason that most people don't care about gifts is because they've received swag and trinkets and promotional products that are all about the person giving it. And that doesn't make anybody feel good. It's basically like, hey, go be a, a billboard for my brand, which is really a manipulation. Like, hey, you've served with our company for 20 years. Here's a Rolex, you know, with Ernst & Young on it. And I'm like, I, I, people are like, well, it's a Rolex. And I'm like, but you just made it a business gift versus a relationship builder, a personal thing. And I'm like, you just de defaced and devalued that relationship because you're trying to turn that person into an advertisement. That's not how you deepen affluent relationships. You should put their name. If they're a person of faith, put a Bible verse. If they're a, an author, put their quote, like make it about them. And if you do a world-class thing like that, like an artifact, subconsciously, they'll never forget. Like if I gave you a Rolex, I wouldn't have to put giftology on it. Like if you notice the knife set that Scott and I sent you, there's no logos. It was all about you because that's what you hear about. Like that's your blood, sweat and tears. So I think so many people are like, John, I did giftology in my company. It doesn't work. And I'm like, no, you did giftology-ish. And they're like, what do you mean? I'm like, you, it's like baking bread. If you bake bread 100,000 times, but you don't put yeast in, guess what you don't get? You don't get bread. It's the little finer things in relationships that either communicate, I see you, I know you, I value you, or here's a gift card, go buy your own gift. You don't matter. And people don't understand that when they don't show up for people the right way, whether it's with a gift or with a handwritten note or how you present yourself, like, subconsciously, we're always evaluating people and saying, does this person really care about me? Are they really in my corner? Or is this really just a transactional relationship? And most people don't understand what they're communicating with the things that they're giving. How has your business changed? I'm curious through the pandemic, you know, as people start to think about like connections, they haven't seen people face to face. I, I'm so curious how, what kind of changes you've seen in your business. Most people default in business in all industries to the same relationship building, you know, tactics or strategies. It's like, hey, take somebody out to dinner, take somebody out to golf, conference, you know, ball game tickets, all of that. And all of that kind of like went away for at least 12 months or a lot of it did. So our phone, I gave more virtual keynotes and sent more gifts. We call them love bombs than we could handle, like to the point where Cutco 
literally was at one point in time back backlogged 70,000 orders. They couldn't make the knives fast enough. That was, it was crazy. So it's, um, I think, you know, they defaulted to that, but what they don't realize is that like a lot of those things, even before the pandemic, like if you go out to dinner with somebody to Morton's or some restaurant, like everybody does the same, you know, the Ritz or the Four Seasons, all that's like, it's all table stakes stuff. And so what I've, what I've challenged people with all along, but even more so now is if you can't get FaceTime with them, how are you like, people are like, Oh, let's just send them some wine or send like, it's like, it's not the act of sending something. It's the act of sending something that makes people say, wow, they really do care about me. They really do see me. And if it feels like it came from Amazon or if it feels like it was just done in mass, like we all want to be treated as an individual. So if we're helping people think through this, I'm like, don't have it come from Amazon. It has to be personalized. Even if it's the same thing going out to everybody, don't do it at an event. Don't do it at a conference. Don't do it. Dear God, don't do it at Christmas. You want to make somebody just feel like part of the obligatory expected masses. The amount of stuff that people send between Thanksgiving and Christmas, I'm like, now they're just a number. Whereas if you, it's like, if I show up for my wife on, you know, anniversaries and Valentine's Day, like those are, those are expected. Like, no, I don't earn any brownie points, but if you show up for your relationships as a just because, and you can do that from afar with thoughtfulness, now all of a sudden, like, instead of having to fly around and see everybody or deal with the pandemic stuff, like literally somebody could hit, you know, a thousand cities in one day and have every, each of those people be like, holy crap, Kara was thinking of me. She didn't send this because it's an anniversary. She didn't send because I did anything just because I was thinking of her. And so that, those sorts of things um, have become more front and center because people, their options of going and just jumping on a plane and seeing somebody was taken away. So now they're having to be more creative about how they build relationships with clients or prospects or employees or whatever else. Very interesting. So one of the things that I think a lot about in, in your story is not having experience. Like people always think like, oh, in order to start a company, you've got to, in order to start an agency, you've got to have experience. You really, I, I think in many ways, you know, hard work and work ethic, you touched on that. But I, but so often people fear that they can't do something. And as I always, you know, especially when I'm speaking, when I call attention to people and I, I hear, you know, the, you know, how did you do it? You, you weren't, uh, you weren't, you didn't have the experience. You, you weren't in my mind prepared in some way. They're really talking about themselves and their own fears. And yeah. what would you say to somebody who's thinking about, you know, maybe I can't be an entrepreneur or, or, you know, I can't do it because, I grew, I didn't grow up with a silver spoon or whatever. I mean, how, how do you tell people to kind of get out of their own way? Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, I was fortunate to have a mentor that I could look at and say, he showed up generously and this is the result. I think that, you know, being careful about who you surround yourself with when you surround yourself, that, that's why masterminds and EO and YPO and some of these different groups are so important is you become the people that you surround yourself with. And I think that, um, even though I was poor and grew up with no silver spoon, I did uh, recognize that, you know, that I, can, I, I was gravitating towards people that were successful. And so I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of examples, like you're a great example. Like there's so many books out there of people that are like, I didn't have any experience, but I dove in and I figured it out. And, you know, like a Jesse Itzler, like his stories of like just showing up, getting creative. He didn't have money for a TED ticket, but he showed up at the, the conference anyway when he was starting Marquee Jets. So I, 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 what I would say is there's thousands of stories of examples of people that didn't have any experience whatsoever. They saw a problem. They were desperate because they didn't have anything. And, you know, over 21 years, my business has evolved. Like I didn't have to figure it all out at one time, like, but I had to dive in and start somewhere. And, um, and I think that most people never start. So like, you know, whether it's a podcast or whether it's a book or whatever it is, like the biggest thing is just making the leap. And then oftentimes things start to like evolve and change and people show up. And, um, but to me, like, I, I would say that the people you surround yourself with, like making sure that you're putting good stuff in your head, reading good books and, you know, taking the time to go, you know, find other people that are crazy entrepreneurs, because that does rub off on you. Absolutely. And I think all the people that you mentioned too, I would, 
say are, you know, thoughtful, right? Uh, and, you know, they think about things, they're big thinkers. And so surrounding yourself with people, and even if you, you know, can't sit down with John Rulin or, or have that one-on-one -on -one conversation, I think reading a lot of what you talk about, I mean, you, you also, you know, through your book and, and definitely on different social, you can go to YouTube and see some of the, some of your talks as well. And oh, I know yeah. you did a great interview with Lewis Howes at one point. And, uh, so anyway, I, I really think that there's so many, there's so many more ways for mentorship today that is, is not necessarily two ways, right. But you start to like, you know, grab a hold of what people are talking about. I mean, Gary's another one, Gary Vaynerchuk, we were talking about and, um, and, There's more content and access to ideas and people free. Like, yeah. I mean, Absolutely. 20 years ago, like, I don't think YouTube existed. Or, like, it, it, the amount of free content and pod, podcasts weren't a thing when I was in college. Like, like there's so much. And in, even like these masterminds, some of them are virtual now. And they're like 100 bucks a month. People are like, John, I can never afford to do what you do or whatever else. I'm like... Like a hundred dollars a month, like even a college kid, if they really wanted to, and oftentimes that like paying just a little bit gets you into a sphere where you're around those kind of people and you're able to get access to the Gary's or the U's or the Jesse's, like a lot of the groups that are out there that are, um, you, you do get intimate access to people in social even like I respond to a lot of people that reach out, college kids reaches out, I'll shoot a video and send it back to them. Um, why? Because I can repurpose that content in other ways. And I also remember what it was like to be in college and not have two nickels to rub together. And I think a lot of people, Jesse and yourself, like people that have come from nothing and built something want to pull people along with us and have totally. part of our legacy be help people. Like totally. we don't want to get to the mountaintop by ourselves. I want when I'm on, you know, like I want a lot of people at my funeral saying, like John gave me this one word and I latched onto it or this one piece of advice or heard him at the stage or I think everybody, I shouldn't say everybody, most people want to have their legacy be like, I brought this many people along with me to success. Not I did it all by myself because nobody gets there by, the, by themselves. No, I think that's so true. So I think about that a lot. Like who, you know, who am I helping people? Am I generous? Am I, um, Am I inspiring people in some way? That's what I want to be known for. And I think that the you know, older, the more experienced you get, you look to try and figure out how to do that. But I think oftentimes people are stuck because they haven't been acting that way. And I'm like, well, start, right? I, I, I don't use that excuse either that how do you get there? How do you, I mean, do you just show up one day and start sending gifts to people or, and it, you know, it's just, I think that you, you do have to almost start somewhere and, oh, for sure. and start to just change things. Yeah. Well, I think that, I mean, Tony, Tony Robbins talks about it. Like he, he gave money away when he didn't, when he had like 16 bucks in his pocket. I do think that there's an element of showing up generously, even when you don't have it. Um, that starts that. And for me in college, I saw Paul and I was like, I saw how people like flocked to him. He was like every idea deal in town. Like he just like radiated, he attracted these people. And so I started $500 a month when I was in college giving gifts. Now that doesn't sound like a lot, but I mean, 20 years ago, that's six grand a year. That was a lot of money, but that, you know, now like has evolved to this year, our gifting budget's about 650 grand personally to send gifts to people. Well, it didn't go from that to that. It, it took 20 years of getting there. But I think that the fun of it is when you, like I'm an introvert naturally and my love language isn't gifting. My love language is words of affirmation. So when I give a gift to somebody, I realized I would get like people to respond and I didn't have to be the life of the party. They would take me around the, the event or the gathering and open doors. So for me, it became kind of addictive of like, I saw when I did that gift that whatever, like people would respond a certain way. And I was like, well, I want to double down on that. I want to do it more and more. And so I think that part of it is just starting. But as human beings, I think from a, at least from a faith perspective for me, like I believe God's wires all to be generous, all to be gift givers. I feel like, you know, we've all received a gift and even being able to, to be born in the U S to be born healthy or whatever else. Like, I feel indebted at some level. And so when I start to give, I feel like that's part of everybody's purpose is to be generous. And, and it comes back around. Like, it's just how the world's wired. Like, 
you do something and it might not be that person, but it comes back tenfold, hundredfold. And if you are playing the true long game, Vaynerchuk talks about it, it's like it's not days, it's decades. You start to see, you know, those things coming back around, maybe not in three months, maybe it's three years. Uh, but for me, over the last 20 years, I, I'm like, I know I'm going to continue to grow that giving because I see the fruit of it. And mm-hmm. most people don't stay in the game long enough to see the fruit. I mean, how long have you had hint? 16 years, 18 years? 16 I mean, it's, years. Yeah. It, it wasn't it's, 16 months. You didn't no. see necessarily the results. Yeah. And it's building it the right way, though, too. I think it's like you start somewhere, right? And you, and I think that, you know, today we, I share a lot with entrepreneurs that, you know, we didn't go and blanket the country with hint right away. We, it actually took us 16 years to, or actually 15 years to, uh, go into Walmart, not because Walmart didn't want us because we, we wanted to a do it right and be able to support it and not screw it up in some way. But also we wanted to make sure that that customer would want hint too. And so there was a confidence thing with me wanting to, I didn't want to fail and I didn't want, I mean, now we, you know, do extremely well in Walmart and Sam's club and, you know, we're in Costco, we're in all of them, but it's, but it's interesting because you know, it's kind of the Rome wasn't built in a day sort of theory. Like people think like, oh, I got to just go and send out. I, I only should gift if I'm, if, if I'm, you know, able to spend $650,000 or what, you know, whatever it is. I think that you start somewhere you start with your top 10, you start with, um, with you know, going from there. Right. Start with one, one right. mentor, one right. advisor, one professor, one, like, yeah, the amount of people are like, oh, I'll, I'll be generous when I'm wealthy. It's like, no, you'll get wealthy because you're generous and, and you know, gifting can work. You know, I, we, have, we have clients that are authors. They have one employee and their budget's, you know, $1,000 a month. You know, that might sound like a lot to some people. Other people are like, in even bigger companies, it's amazing to me. People are like, John, I can, I, we can't afford to do what you're talking about. And I'm like... You hired two employees last week and made the decision in five minutes. That added a hundred thousand dollars in fixed cost overhead labor to your company. When's the last time you invested a hundred grand in the fifty relationships that even allowed you to have a business? And and they're like deer in the headlights. They're like, "What way to call me out on the BS? Like you're right. I did make that decision in five minutes to, to add a hundred grand. And you're right. I've never invested a hundred thousand dollars into my top relationships, and it's the same hundred thousand dollars. So it's it's oftentimes, I think we put these like, you know, hurdles or we, we, we look at certain things a certain way as business owners and we don't realize the blind spots that we sometimes have. And, and we'll, we'll do something over here this way and over here, we're not willing to do it. And it's, and oftentimes it's fear. It's, oh, I've never done it that way before or whatever else. Like, um, but yeah, it's it's funny to see people say, oh, I could never do that. I don't have that much money or I don't have that many relationships. And I'm like, we all have relationships that are important to us. Um, it's just a matter of taking the time to write them down and like and then, you know, loving on them like we mean it versus checking the box and doing that out of obligation. I love it. So great. Well, John, thank you so much. And everybody wow. needs to definitely follow John uh, and also pick up a copy of Giftology and certainly go to his site. What's the best way for people to connect with you, by the way? Yeah. So I would say, I mean, a couple of things. One is um, for people that want to go take this process, the system and go do it on their own, they can go download what we charge tens of thousands of dollars to go do it. If we do it with them, they can download our whole playbook for free giftologyplan.com. And it literally talks about who they should send gifts to and how they should love on them. What should the budget be? What the timing, all of that. Um, and, I, and I really get excited about people not just hiring our agency, but to actually like I, the amount of people we talk to are like, hey, I took that, I did that, and I got, I landed my largest account, or I did this. Like, I get excited about people taking this and running with it and being more generous. Uh, if they want to look at our site and kind of like speaking, consulting, and get ideas, Giftology Group is our core site. Mm-hmm. And I post most of my more original stuff on social media at johnruland.com and on, uh, or not at John Rulin at, on Instagram is, uh, is where a lot That's of great. it is my daughters and me with my family, but it also, we do share some of our best ideas on the gifting side. I love it. No, it, I've 
looked at it and it's super great and definitely check that out. And I'm all over social at Kara Golden. I, uh, have a, a book that John has, uh, actually gifted to, uh, a few people, uh, as well. And it's called Undaunted Overcoming Doubts and Doubters. If you haven't read it or listened to it on Audible, definitely, uh, have a listen. And thank you so much, John. Uh, we like, this has been absolutely amazing. We're here every Monday and Wednesday. So hopefully if you are just for the first time listening in on the show, uh, you will subscribe and come back and have a great rest of the week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, John. Thanks, Kara.